Chalo Dilli. Onwards to Delhi. That was their battle cry. More than that, it was an expression of pain for a long sought after dream. A dream of freedom for India. Give me blood and I'll give you freedom, he had said. And from Singapore, on that overcast July day in 1943, the Azad Hind Fauj would begin its march to Delhi. They would reach Imphal, and for the first time, the Indian flag would flutter proudly in the Indian sky. Yet the moment of triumph would be fleeting. In the jungles of Burma, the forgotten army would make one last stand, and their dream was to shatter in the pain of defeat. More than half a century later, some of them returned. The Azad Hind expedition would retrace that historic march. This is the story of those who returned. Singapore, the Queen of the East, known in legend as Temasek, was the stage from which the dramatic and inspiring story of the Indian National Army was first enacted. It was Singapore from where the Azad Hind expedition began its 10,000 kilometer journey to Delhi, retracing the footsteps of the Indian National Army. With Christmas only a week away, Singapore wore a bright festive look. Accompanied by the three INA veterans, the legendary Colonel Dillon, Colonel Lakshmi Seidel and Captain Yadav, we set out to discover places associated with the INA. Farrah Park, where the Indian prisoners of war were handed over to General Mohan Singh by the Japanese. The grassy grounds of the Padang, where the INA troops first demonstrated their resolve to fight to the finish. Cathay Hall, which in July 1943 had echoed with the shouting of nationalist slogans as Netaji promised the Indians in East Asia that the sun would finally set on the British Empire. And the INA monument on the seafront, rebuilt on the ruins of the original one, destroyed by Mount Batten when the British reconquered Singapore in 1945. The monument is now a rallying point and a place of pilgrimage for the living veterans of the INA. Paying our homage to the glorious sons and daughters of India who laid down their lives for the freedom of their motherland, the expedition left Singapore. Crossing the Johor Strait to the Malay Peninsula, our searching gaze was riveted by the luxuriant tropical vegetation, groves of tall palm trees and the splendid highways that carry you like a breeze. Kuala Lumpur has all the enlivening signs of a flourishing 20th century boom town. Broad, clean avenues full of cars, a baffling web of concrete flyovers, Crowds of people hurrying to their workplaces, shopping mouths overflowing with electronic goods, buzzing fast food stalls, and high-rise buildings that dazzle the eye. With Indian settlers accounting for 10% of Malaysia's population, the country was a fertile ground for INA recruitment and fund collection. 
we spend a sentimental evening with some of the INA veterans living in Malaysia. The heroic Captain Amrik Singh Gill of the INA Secret Service, who infiltrated India and was captured during an operation. He escaped while being taken for execution. He now sits crippled and confined to a wheelchair. Leaving Kuala Lumpur, we were caught in a heavy downpour of winter rains. When the rain stopped, we could see for miles plantations of tall, spindly rubber trees. The highway running through the center of the Malay Peninsula was fast and smooth. No potholes, no encroachments, no speed breakers, no cyclists or herds of cattle. Stars were already in the sky when we arrived at Guantan, greeted by the pandemic beating of Malay drums. From the estuary town of Guantan, we took the coastal route, with the South China Sea always in view. Our energy is drained from all the shoving and pushing. We stopped by a roadside restaurant to sample the debatable delights of a Malay delicacy. While others beat a hasty retreat, Sunil Dutt stood his ground and suffered till the end. As we left Kuala Tarangano for Penang on a 650-kilometer drive that would take us across the peninsula Malaysia, the monsoons were upon us in earnest. Approaching the central mountains, we could hear the noise of rain in the distance. It grew louder and louder until, with a thundering roar, squalls of rain began lashing the jeeps. The scenery was awesome, wild and rough. The dense forest trees soaring 200 feet into the sky and huge creepers hanging on them in graceful festoons. We wondered if the wild Semang, the Negrito dwarfs who had lived in these jungles for 8,000 years still existed. Crossing a 14 kilometer long bridge the longest in Asia, we arrived on the island of Penang. The glittering gem of the ocean. The headquarters of the INA Secret Service. And the launching pad for INA soldiers taking the sea route to the battlefronts of Burma. For those who enjoy seafood, Penang is the place. Restaurants display live fish in an aquarium before cooking your selection. While we waited for the Burmese ship to fetch us from Penang, we amused ourselves on the beach, riding water scooters, parasailing, and swimming nervously, looking out for sea snakes that lived in these waters. 
When MV Haka sailed in, it could not find a berth in the busy port. We loaded our vehicles on a barge and using steel ropes and sandbags, lifted them onto the ship anchored in open seas. With only the expeditionists and the five vehicles on board, we had the entire ship to ourselves. It was three days and three nights of perfect, restful happiness. No phone calls to wake you up, no newspapers to depress your spirits, no bills to pay, breakfast at noon, napping under the awnings, engulfed in a motionless sea, its waters as smooth as glass, with nothing in sight except the far horizon. We arrived at the mouth of the Gulf of Martaban and escorted by a squadron of seagulls sailed into a broad deep puddle stirring up huge quantities of mud. A large part of Mulmeen's population of 200,000 is of Indian origin. The Indians migrated here during the 19th century when Burma became a part of British India. Hundreds of these settlers now turned up to welcome the expedition defying the country's martial law that prohibits gatherings of more than nine people. The Azad Hind expedition was a confident statement of India's foreign policy of friendship and peaceful coexistence with its neighbors. In this spirit of mutual respect and love, we visited the old people's home in Mulmeen and presented its residents with small bronze Buddhas. The road from Mulmeen to Rangoon belongs in a museum. It appears to be a remnant of World War II. However, it is full of interesting spectacles. To our right was the Golden Rock Pagoda, a giant boulder in the sky, balancing on another rock said to be supported by a strand of Buddha's hair, attracting believers and unbelievers alike. Escorted by Burmese military and intelligence officers, our convoy was rushed through the streets of Rangoon at night. Whisked into our hotel, the gates were slammed shut. We were told not to leave the hotel with our vehicles. The government had withdrawn permission for the expedition to travel further through Burma. Trying to trace people and places associated with the INA, we spent our days in Rangoon always under the eye of Big Brother. Behind a gloomy Rangoon ghetto, in a lonely grave forgotten and unknown, lies Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor of India, who took up arms against the British and for that heroic deed was exiled to Rangoon in 1857. आज मुझे उस वक्त की याद आ रही है जब के नेताजी सुभाष चंद्र बोस मजार की मिट्टी को उठा के उसी की कसम खाई थी कि अब हिंदुस्तान के आखिरी शहंशाह मैं तेरी मिट्टी की कसम खा के कहता हूँ और बहादुर शाह जफर का ही शेर पड़ा था राजियों में भी रहेगी जब चलक ईमान की तख्त लंदन तक चलेगी तेग हिंदुस्तान की और वो तेग लेके लेता ही आगे बढ़ते On New Year's Eve, all our worries were forgotten, and the sounds of merrymaking resounded 
as we danced into 1996. Rangoon is a city full of mystic marvels. The Shwedagon Pagoda, the most impressive shrine of Buddhism. The giant reclining Buddha, unmoved and unattached, observing developments in this once mighty empire. Our patience tested, the military authorities relaxed the ban on our movements and allowed us to travel further north on the condition that we did not attract attention. Two days later, when we arrived at Ziawadi, there was an avalanche of Indians from the surrounding villages, a great surge of common people, old and young, men, women and children, whose families had given money and their lives for India's independence. So many of them came to greet the expedition. As we left Ziawadi, we were intercepted by the intelligence and told to return to Rangoon without delay. If we did not, the leaders of the Indian community would be at risk. Back in Rangoon, the Burmese authorities made it clear that only one point was open to discussion, and that was the early departure of the expedition. There was no choice but to retreat. But we did manage to extract one concession. The veterans and the film crew would be allowed to complete the route within Burma. Colonel Dillon and Captain Lakshmi Seigel were visibly excited. They never forgot Burma. That was the place where their youthful dreams were put into action. That was the scene of many struggles and the source of many memories for them, whether of joy or of sorrow. Fifty years ago they were young, full of nationalist pride and passion and hope, and the world lay waiting for them. Now, fifty years later, in the sunset of their lives, with youth and illusions gone, they moved once again to the center of the stage. An Indian Air Force transport plane airlifted the rest of the members and the vehicles from Rangoon to Imphal to continue the expedition. Once back in India, we set out for the places where the INA had seen action in Manipur. We drove through the Palail airstrip that was captured by Major Pritham Singh after fierce fighting and crossing the Lotu River. We drove to the frontier town of Murray on the Burmese border. It was tempting to cross the border and drive into Burma once again. The administrator of Tamu on the Burmese side invited us to enter his territory, which we did. We drove back on the same iron-girded bridge that had once been used by the Azad Brigade 
to cross into Moray on its way to take part in the fighting in Minta and Naru. We travel the length of the Tidim Imphal Road in South Manipur, from which the number one division of the BINA had knocked on the gates of Imphal. Our convoy arrived in a procession at Moirang, where on April the 18th, 1944, Sardare Jang Shokot Ali Malik hoisted the Indian flag in an atmosphere of excited and belligerent expectation. Our rugged vehicles climbed boldly up a virtually non-existent trail to the summit of Red Hill, the last strategic spot captured by the INA. Ten kilometers to the north was Imphal, the capture of which could have been the turning point in World War II. It was from Red Hill that the INA's retreat began. As we negotiated the winding mountain road to Kohima, our eyes were never weary of the lush green hillscape. Tall flames swayed in the fire as angelic-looking Naga girls gave us a warm and affectionate welcome. Under the mellow moonlight of a January winter, the Naga land of poetry and romance stood revealed. All along the route, entire villages would be waiting to greet the expedition. As we got into the more populated areas of Assam, our vehicles were crawling through a virtual sea of humanity. The drive from Shillong to Cherapunji is like travelling to the ends of the earth. The rugged mountains, the deep gorges and canyons, the play of light, all combine to give an impression of having arrived at the very edges of the planet. Descending into the valley of the Brahmaputra and racing past the forests of North Bengal, we headed along the gorge of the Tista to Gantok. Beyond the charms of Gantok lay the most wondrous winter panorama of giant mountains clad in fresh snow, frozen lakes, yaks exhaling clouds of refrigerated breath. Our vehicles climbed to dizzying heights on the wet and icy road, negotiating an endless series of hairpin bends with ease and confidence. Under the most adverse road and weather conditions, we drove on the treacherous road to Nathula, beyond which lay Tibet. Engulfed by dense fog and clouds, we raised full-throated slogans of Jai Hind. <laughs> Within India, the expedition became a mass contact program to create an awakening amongst the youth of their national responsibilities. As the expedition progressed through Bengal, and on the Grand Trunk Road across Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. The huge crowds provided us with a captive audience to whom we could communicate our message. Recalling the glorious sacrifices of the INA soldiers, we appealed to the youth to rededicate themselves to the high principles of our freedom fighters, to raise the country to new levels of achievement and national growth, and take up the challenge of fighting poverty. Having captured the spirit of the freedom struggle, 
the Azad Hind expedition arrived at the gates of the Red Fort in Delhi, once the goal of the Indian National Army. Thank you.